B would be the more acidic for both reasons. In one case, in the A compound, the acidity is decreased by the uh, electron uh, uh, supplying group, and in B, it is increased by the electron uh, attracting group. In the oxidation set, uh, number three, uh, again, the reason the choices were usually good, but the reasons were, could have been improved in some cases. Uh, the cyanin is certainly more oxidizable because it's possible to produce the orthoquinone in the B ring. Yes. And the malvidin is methoxylated on both positions, so in neither side could you produce an orthoquinone. So the methoxy groups are not oxidizable. Malvidin would oxidize as if it were a monophenol or would require the removal of the ether groups before it would be oxidizable. So clearly, uh, uh, cyanin is more oxidizable. Uh, in, one, in B, I wanted you to say that, it's, uh, that the naphthol is much more acidic, as you could determine from your uh, notes. PK is 3.7 and cresol PK is 10. Uh, so being much more acidic, it should be much less oxidizable because of course, if you can remove hydrogen, it means the uh, electron is held tightly to the naphthol. So to oxidize off an electron would be more difficult the more acidic the compound. In the catechol, again, the same reasoning as with the Malvin, and Malvin set. Uh, the methoxy group is not oxidizable. And that, again, I suppose you could say was a catch because the 1,4-dihydroxy would be more oxidizable than the 1,2-dihydroxy, but not after methoxylation. Uh, paragallol is more oxidizable than catechol, and several of you used the reasoning that more OHs generally leads to more oxidizability, and while that is a rule of thumb, it isn't as good as a more specific answer. If you make the oxidized paragallol, you have this compound, and the hydrogen bonding of this sort would facilitate the oxidation, so you would expect pyrogallol to oxidize much more readily than uh, catechol, and in fact, the redox potentials in your sheet would uh, illustrate that point. Juglone, a similar story, except that in the case of the juglone, the peri-OH is much more strongly hydrogen bonded because of the five-membered ring relationship so that uh, uh, the juglone would be much more oxidizable than the pyrogallol, and this would again be shown by uh, the table if you looked them up. Those both happen to be present in the table. Uh, and in the uh, F set, the extended conjugated system possible in the para compound would make it much more oxidizable. So when you oxidize that compound, you would get the extended conjugation, whereas in the other one, the meta at least would be crossed, and uh, you couldn't completely uh, oxidize it uh, to make a, a stable uh, type compound. So you'd expect B to be more readily oxidized than A. I think the other questions, uh, well, no, I should go just a little longer, I think. Question four, I rather expected few would answer, and I was somewhat gratified that several of you did answer it. And most of you made it reasonably well, had the idea, although uh, perhaps not the most clear. For instance, on the separation of the three compounds, the technique that seems most obvious and certainly would work, from my viewpoint, is to make the aqueous solution strongly acid, so you're sure the uh, carboxy group of the gallic acid is not ionized and extract with ethyl acetate. If you did this, you'd leave the glycoside in the water and get both gallic acid and catechin in the ethyl acetate solution. And then if you extracted the ethyl acetate solution with sodium bicarbonate, you'd get the gallic acid in the sodium bicarbonate solution and leave the catechin in the ethyl acetate. So some variation of that kind of thing was the sort of thing I would have hoped to find. Uh, the Flavone question uh, is, is in your notes fairly clearly, and several of you got it that way, but also, and in two places uh, for that matter, the main point being that uh, if the phenolic group is to ionize in sodium acetate, it has to be as acidic as acetic acid, or nearly so. 
Uh, therefore, it had to be a very acidic phenolic group. Now, it couldn't be on the B ring because the B ring OHs would be like phenol and have PKs of around, well, I think your book says eight, your notes are eight, but say around eight to 10 in that range. So it couldn't be on the B ring and react with sodium acetate. That means it's got to be on the A ring. And the, five, the only two positions it's likely to be in normal circumstance would be five and seven. Five in a flavone would be strongly hydrogen bonded and be even less acidic. And the seven, on the other hand, would be activated by the carbonyl in the uh, four position and be quite acidic. So that it could only be in the seven position. Then I think most of you got the paper, or otherwise the chromatography sequence. I picked only a pair. The, uh, some didn't get the mechanism quite right. Uh, in the two-phase system, the uh, glucoside would be most soluble in the water phase, and that's the stationary phase, so it would be held back and stick to the, to the paper or move more slowly uh, on the paper. Uh, in the uh, one-phase system, uh, it is an aqueous system, and the aqueous system would carry the glucoside along more rapidly so that uh, in that case you would expect I want to pass this back please in that case you'd expect the uh, glycoside to precede the aglycone and uh, another reason that this would be the case is that the only mechanism holding the aglycone back is adsorption via hydrogen bonding to the cellulose. And we gave you the rule that phenolic OHs would uh, increase adsorption to uh, hydrogen bonding materials, whereas sugar OHs would not. Well, that applies to the polyamide as well then. Uh, and the hydrogen bonding would make the one with the one more, the aglycone has one more and the most acidic at that, a phenolic OH, and therefore would hydrogen bond more strongly. In the oxidation uh, question, uh, most everybody that attempted it did pretty well on the nature of the products. Uh, relatively few, and most of you got the idea of the continued oxidation. In other words, if you produce the semiquinone, let's go back just to this compound, for instance. If you oxidize a phenol uh, to the semiquinone and produce a dimer that looks like this, by quenching of the two free radicals with the uh, uh, free radical electrons in the para position, uh, then the covalent bond is formed. And then by enolization, the hydrogens can migrate back and you end up with the regenerated phenolic material. So that oxidation produces the polymerization, but the polymerization Although the net effect is still an oxidized product, the product becomes one that can oxidize again. So that the use of more oxygen or oxidant to convert this then to a semiquinone free radical and further polymerization, uh, most of you got that. What you didn't get though uh, very well is why is it that the further oxidation de generally focuses on the polymeric or dimeric material? Well, the reason is that ignoring that this is uh, still a phenol, we've stuck on a phenyl group. And the phenyl group, just as the alkyl group, uh, it decreases the acidity of the phenol. Now, if you decrease the acidity of the phenol, you make it more oxidizable or lower the redox potential. Therefore, the product of the oxidation has a lower redox potential and is more oxidizable than the starting material. And that being so, then it's autocatalytic and would go faster as it oxidize more and, and most of you got some aspect of that but maybe not that clearly. I don't want to go through all of them. Numbers, I think we can probably quit with number six. Number six, most of you that answered that did very well. Uh, the one thing that I think only one person brought in that I had rather hoped you would, uh, the evidence that high phenol level can cause cell death is present in several things we've mentioned, but I think the clearest example is in the case of boron deficiency. You have a normal plant, and then in boron deficiency, you get a buildup of phenols for a, for a pretty well postulated and reasonably proven mechanism. And then this leads to necrosis in local condition and eventual death of the plant. So otherwise, the plant seems normal, and it appears it's killing itself by an excess production of phenols. 
Uh, so that was the example that, that normal phenols at high levels can be toxic that I had personally in mind. There are other good examples too. Uh, and then the hypersensitivity was the other aspect that nearly everyone got. I think from there on, those who answered the questions did rather well, and I don't see much point in taking class time to go over them. I will, as I said, uh, post uh, an example. If you have trouble interpreting my uh, words on the posted copy outside my office, uh, come in and see me and we'll clear it up. Any comments or questions? Yes. I didn't average them. Uh, I'd guess offhand it was about uh, 80. There were th three grades in the 90s, four, four grades uh, in, in the 90s, but that was 90 or 91. And uh, there were uh, three grades in the 60s, so that uh, it, it would center around 80, 85. I didn't bother to average it. As far as what we'll do with the grades, uh, in as much as the ones who'd got lower grades, I say generally either blew one question fairly thoroughly, uh, therefore they mostly either got the wrong concept. I don't really think, I think we should look at this test as mainly a learning experience and not a quality evaluation experience, and I'm not going to use it as a heavy lever to decide who gets what at the end. In other words, there's nobody has a grade on this test that would keep me from giving them an A if they do well on the final. I uh, don't mean to say that I won't consider it at all. Certainly a person that got 90 on both has an ed edge over the person that got 60 on both, but uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, I, I do think both tests are mainly intended to illustrate points and uh, uh, help your education, not necessarily help decide how to form the letters. And I might as well say the way I've generally decided on letter grades in the class is that uh, most of the class gets A's or B's, depending on how well they did relative to each other, and the very few bottom ones, particularly if it looks like they weren't trying, uh, get C's. And that is, or worse, if, if it merits. Um, and it seems fair to me in a graduate class with this much material, because uh, it is, I would find it impossible myself without my own notes, I think, to get a absolutely perfect answer on every question that might be dreamed up in this class because we do cover uh, quite a bit of material as you're well aware. Any more comments or questions on the test or what we'll do with it? Okay, uh, uh, this has taken a good deal of our time period and so I want to streamline our discussion about phenols in animals. There was another pair of, of sheets to be passed out this morning or to be picked up this morning and I'm going to uh, skip very quickly over most of the notes and come down to what I think is the most interesting from the uh, wine man's viewpoint as to what are the uh, phenolic relationships that may have significance in consumption of normal phenols. But I do, I think, need to mention a few instances of phenol participation in uh, normal metabolism in animals. You have several references listed, and the two with asterisks are on reserve in the Viticulture Library if you'd like to read them. Uh, it isn't just that they're mine, but I think they're probably uh, the best things in overall description of the phenolic toxicity for, again, the same reason that I hope this class has value, in that up till now, people that have talked about phenols in the diet have tended to talk about a phenol. So isn't dicumarole interesting because it, your blood won't clot if you take it and this kind of thing? Instead of saying, what does this mean as, as a phenol and phenols in general? And for that reason, I think we're about the first ones, uh, Dr. Kratzer and I, to take this attitude, and I believe it's an important one, and I hope it uh, will catch on and, and uh, help people to think of these. Uh, they think of alkaloids as a group of compounds. Why can't they think of phenols as a group of compounds? Uh, the tyrosine story is fairly well known to you, I think, and the fact that tyrosine converts to thyroxine, which is the thyroid hormone, uh, is perhaps uh, not so well known, but if you looked at the structure, you'd realize it. Would you close the door for me, please? Thank you. The uh, addition of the iodine is by a, a normal phenolic-type substitution reaction, 
And uh, the second ring, in fact, comes from tyrosine as well, so that it is a direct metabolite from tyrosine. And this is, of course, why you need iodine in your diet and why if you grew up in central Indiana like I did before iodized salt, uh, you would see a lot of goiters. Uh, on my school bus route where we picked up 40 or 50 kids, I remember three wives uh, that had uh, goiters, you know, great big. And you just don't see those anymore with iodized salt. And that happened to be a part of the country where iodine is naturally deficient. Uh, DOPA, you've been hearing about lately because of its use in treatment of Parkinson's disease, which shows that it, metabolism of DOPA is very important. DOPA is the dihydroxy uh, derivative from uh, tyrosine or uh, two hydroxys on phenylalanine. It is made from tyrosine by the body. But apparently in Parkinsonism, it uh, somehow is either made in insufficient quantities or can't get into the brain, and, and therefore you get the nervous conditions and so on of Parkinson's disease. Uh, certain kinds of manganese toxicity are treated by extra doses of uh, DOPA as well, and this is apparently due to chelation of the manganese in some way that uh, is rather specific for DOPA. Also, DOPA is the starting material for all the brown and black and red pigments of the animal world and a few of them of the plant world. So when a banana turns black, uh, it's because it contains dopamine, in that case not uh, the uh, amino acid, but in any case it comes from the amino acid. So uh, uh, the melanin production in animals is from DOPA, and we'll come back to it uh, to some degree when we talk about browning because the chemistry of melanin formation is better understood than the other kinds of brown pigments. Um, the catecholamines are very important in nerve transmission and uh, epinephrine, or you may know it better as adrenaline, uh, is uh, the main catecholamine and noradrenaline is uh, uh, the precursor of it. Uh, these drugs are extremely important and the research in this area is great. I've had a recent uh, search of chemical abstracts initiated on uh, phenolic materials, and I made the mistake of asking for references on catechol uh, without excluding catecholamine. And uh, so the first 100 references I got were about 99 on catecholamine, not what I wanted, and therefore I had to change the program of the computer. But it illustrates the fact that probably over a year's time, right now, there's 5,000 research papers on catecholamine and its effect and, and chemistry and biochemistry in humans usually or animals. So it's a very important study and uh, critical to our metabolism. And the uh, fact that it's a nerve active agent uh, is, uh, is explains why its metabolism and degradation has to be very quick. And it happens that uh, adrenaline is decomposed or made inactive first by methylation of the catechol, uh, one of the two catechol oxygen uh, phenolic groups, and uh, then uh, decarboxylation, deamina deamination rather, to the aldehyde group by an enzyme called monoamine oxidase. So the MAO enzyme and its inhibitors, and it turns out that. Uh, barbiturates, for instance, inhibit this, this enzyme, so they would uh, delay the breakdown of the adrenaline and any uh, imitating drug that was taken. And this is one, re and, and alcohol is involved in the whole picture uh, for reasons of at least uh, liver detoxification reactions of ethanol. So this is one reason why when you take barbiturates and uh, tranquilizers and ethanol all in a package, after a big drinking party while you're apt not to wake up the next morning. And this has happened to quite a few important people. You, perhaps you're mostly too young to have ever heard of Dorothy Kilgallen, but she used to be a regular panelist on What's My Line and this kind of thing. And she killed herself this way, apparently. She went to a cocktail party, had a good deal of alcohol, came home, took a uh, sleeping pill and uh, maybe a, uh, another one or two on top of it, and clearly without intention to commit suicide did that. Uh, so, and it happens to others as well. Uh, this whole picture is an extremely important and does explain some of the interaction of phenols in the hallucinogen, et cetera, area. So if you interfere with catecholamine metabolism 
as with mescaline, for example, which is a phenolic derivative uh, from pyote, you will get uh, hallucinations and uh, it apparently is through its interference with the normal nerve effect of these particular kinds of substances. Serotonin and melatonin are somewhat related uh, but have more restricted uh, roles, not involved with all nervous action. Serotonin is 5-hydroxytryptamine and you can see it is a phenol and derived by tryptophan, derived from tryptophan. It's a potent vasoconstrictor and helps to prevent bleeding. Uh, it is released from platelets as the blood clots and it does have some role in maintenance of normal intestinal peristalsis. And if you interfere with serotonin metabolism and produce, for instance, uncontrolled peristalsis, and peristalsis, if you don't know the term, is if you have a, if you have a tube like an intestine, peristalsis is a, a wave motion where the muscles that go around the tube uh, contract and then this wave of contraction moves down in one way or the other, normally toward the exit and abnormally uh, to cause regurgitation, for instance. Uh, this peristalsis then moves the food along through the alimentary canal. Well, one of the apparent effects of certain phenolic cathartics then is to decontrol this so that you get much faster peristalsis and uh, of course the equivalent of diarrhea. Uh, so that this may explain, seems to explain why some phenols behave as potent cathartics. Melatonin is a hormone, has nothing directly to do with melanin, but it does have indirect uh, much to do with uh, pigmentation. And it's quite interesting, you may know the pineal gland is in the upper part of the brain and is sometimes called a third eye. At one time there were lizards and dinosaurs that had three eyes and it sort of appears that the pineal gland may be uh, some sort of an evolutionary change of that third eye, whether that's true or not. It is true that even though it's inside the brain, it does respond to light, which is rather strange. And if you grow an animal in the dark, for instance, it'll never develop sexually maturity. And the reason is that the melatonin uh, uh, production uh, controls gonad development and sexual maturity and estrus for that matter so that if you put a, a f perfectly normal female sheep in the dark keep it in the dark it won't ever uh, come into heat as the farmer would say and uh, be receptive to breeding also it does have to do with melanization to some degree and particularly in the normal melanization that is that that's over over and above response to light so for instance animals kept in the dark don't have iris pigmentation and this is perhaps one reason why if you have uh, cave salamanders and fish that have spent many generations in the caves they're albinos there may not be uh, they may uh, not be strict albinos in the sense of uh, irreparability but they are albinos in the sense that uh, they don't produce any pigments well I could go on and I'm taking too much time with some of these things. The estrogens are important female hormones and are phenolic and are made from acetate units in the animal. So this would be the one known example where the animal makes a phenol directly. Uh, interestingly enough, any fairly planar molecule with two OH groups at about the same distance apart as estradiol is a, uh, potent as an estrogen. So that this explains why genistein, an isoflavone, is a pretty good uh, or, um, abnormal estrogen. Uh, and uh, diethylstilbestrol and a few others, which are not phenols. Uh, well, yes, excuse me, diethylstilbestrol is. But uh, some are not phenols, but they do have OH groups and a planar molecule about that distance apart. Then the vitamins we've mentioned indirectly, and I think you know something about the tocopherols, vitamins E, the menadione type compounds, vitamins K, and the plastoquinones and ubiquinones, which are involved in some sorts of uh, free radical uh, mechanisms and oxidations and electron transport in uh, foods and in the human being and other animals. This brings us then to the question of detoxification. And uh, detoxification is the term generally used not only for the abnormal phenol, but for the normal phenol. So that a lot of the compounds uh, that are normally present in the human body, and for that matter, including uh, the breakdown products of uh, adrenaline and so on, 
uh, end up in the urine as phenolic derivatives, and they're usually uh, metabolized by some form of demethyl, uh, some form of detoxification, which involves converting them to an acidic, highly water soluble derivative, so that ordinarily they are conjugated with sulfuric acid to give what are called ethereal sulfates or sulfur sulfuric acid esters of the phenolic group, which is certainly acid and certainly very water soluble or glucuronic acid conjugation, which is like the glycoside formation, except instead of glucose, glucose it's glucuronic acid, and uh, then methylation. Now, methylation is usually accomplished on the compounds that are already very acidic and very water-soluble. And it's quite intriguing, in one of the handouts, uh, the smaller of the two pages of the handouts today, uh, gives some examples of metabolism of flavonoids and the products therefrom, but it's quite interesting that the normal metabolism of pyrogallol derivatives in plants puts methoxy groups on in the three or five position. The normal metabolism in an animal puts a methoxy group in the four position. And I think that shows uncommonly great uh, common sense in Mother Nature because the uh, effect desired here appears to be to prevent oxidation. And yet, methyl groups are generally in short supply. Methionine is low in the diet. Choline is apt to be deficient. So to squander a methyl group that you'd like to use to make methionine or other more important substances in a detoxification reaction is maybe necessary. It must be necessary or it wouldn't be done. But you'd have to squander two if you went at it from the 3-5 viewpoint. And this way, we can conserve methyl groups and put it in this position. And then we can't get an orthoquinone in either case. Uh, so it's quite intriguing that the animals have adapted to metabolize uh, phenols of that type in quite a different way than plants have. In the plant, the four position is conserved, and the other are methoxylated. In the animal, the reverse is true. Uh, also, you will find that a number of compounds are, are hydroxylated by the animal, and a mechanism for both a methoxylation and a uh, uh, transfer to give a, an increased hydroxy uh, derivative, in, the case, in this case, homogentisic acid, is given on the other passout, the longer of the two passout sheets. So if you might take a look at that now. Notice that s methionine is the source of the methyl group, and it apparently acts through a magnesium chelation uh, to uh, activate the OH group and then transfer the methyl. Uh, and this is no doubt the same mechanism for O-methyl transfer in the plant, but uh, in the case of the pyrogallol, it centers on a different location. Homogentisic acid is the uh, compound with one, it's gentisic acid with one more CH2 group uh, before the carboxyl. And notice that this mechanism would be an explanation of the exact kind of NIH shift that we postulated in the case of plants to account for the formation of gentisic acid when we can't find gentisic acid as a normal phenolic constituent in plants, but do find it after an extensive, extensive hydroxylation. And while this is fairly hypothetical as written, it is apparently a very logical in the probable way that the uh, CH2 group is transferred to a new position and the leaving position is hydroxylated. In any case, it, it does illustrate uh, an example of hydroxylation as a way of detoxifying uh, or at least metabolizing phenols, probably to make them more water soluble. And this is a normal uh, process in the plant, as I mentioned. Of course, hydroxylation in the tyrosine to dopa uh, sense is, is well uh, documented. Salicylic acid, if you take in aspirin, you excrete at least part of it as gentisic acid and part of it as benzoic acid. Uh, also, benzoic tends to be hydroxylated to give salicylic so that uh, you can both dehydroxylate and hydroxylate. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, quinic acid is metabolized uh, uh, as a hippuric acid, which hippuric acid is a benzoic acid derivative with uh, glycine attached. And benzoic also gives hippuric as, does some of the, as do some of the phenolic derivatives of benzoic acid. So in general, then, we're adding glycine, we're adding methyl groups, we're adding glucuronic acid groups, we're adding sulfuric acid groups as ways of 
detoxifying the, the phenols that are occurring in the diet and you would be generally producing an acid derivative, urine is acid, uh, and a water soluble derivative. In the cases where you would be decreasing the water solubility, it's in a compound that's quite water soluble to begin with. Also note that you would be using up methyl groups, which we mentioned would be desired to be kept, and you'd also be using up glycine and glucuronic acid, which otherwise would have food value. So there'd be a net drain on the energy sources of the animal to detoxify the phenols. Now this brings me, I think I'll drop the notes at this point and go to the uh, overheads. Uh, Examples then in the phenols of what we might, in, in nutrition of what we might call good phenols would be things like tyrosine and the vitamins and the bioflavonoids, which we briefly mentioned and may come back to. Uh, neutral would be most common phenols of the chlorogenic acid et al group, and what might be called bad phenols would be those that have shown to be toxic, like gossypol from cottonseed, saffron from sassafras and coumarin from uh, legumes and, and tonka beans, etc. Well, that illustrates the point then that, as you well know them now, the usual plant phenols that have substitutions of these kinds then do not appear in the list of bad phenols. They do appear in the list of neutral phenols. Therefore, the detoxification me mechanisms, which still apply to these compounds, must be quite good and efficient. And one would make the point then that these compounds have been in the diet forever, as far as we know, and therefore animals have learned to metabolize them very readily. And then when you get into the unusual compounds, the animal may not have learned to uh, metabolize them. And there are two general kinds of defense that the animal has, both adsorption barriers and uh, penetration barriers and detoxification barriers. So that, for instance, if you some plants contain a high content of adrenaline, like for instance uh, nettles. The reason the nettle stings so badly is that it's injecting uh, uh, adrenaline into your skin. And it, of course, gives you a violent reaction because adrenaline produces that sort of thing when it's uh, introduced. Uh, if you ate the nettle, it would, providing it didn't, the needles didn't go through your intestinal wall, it wouldn't bother you because you would detoxify it and it would never be absorbed as such. And the very fact that serotonin, for example, occurs in, in a banana to something like 50 times as much, 50,000 times as much in a gram as in a bee sting, then you could imagine that it'd make quite a difference that you didn't inject any banana material uh, into your uh, body, except by mouth. Uh, detoxification, of course, is the other mechanism. Now, if we postulate then that uh, these phenols all are toxic if they're not detoxified. It would mean then that they should be at some dosage uh, toxic, and it turns out that they are in fact. And if we uh, say, for instance, compare phenols subcutaneously in a rabbit, it takes 600 milligrams per kilogram of body weight to have the LD50 kill lethal dose for 50% of the rabbits uh, subcutaneously uh, in the case of the rabbit. And the oral dose for the rat is uh, from 500 to 1300 depending on who did the measurements and in the rat subcutaneous is 400 so generally speaking the subcutaneous dose of phenol is more toxic than the oral dose uh, and notice that the carnivore a cat is much more sensitive to phenol and without elaborating any further I would uh, just say some examples of phenols that are toxic strychnine is not a phenol but is a potent alkaloid but epinephrine or adrenaline is uh, about as toxic as strychnine if it's injected, and rotenone, a, a phenolic uh, insecticide of natural origin, is somewhat toxic. Whereas rutin, a normal phenol, even intravenously, it takes 950 milligrams per kilogram body weight. In other words, a gram, you weigh, say, roughly 70 grams, so it takes 70 grams injected before it would kill 50% of the humans on that basis. So it's pretty low in toxicity, and lupulone, the beer bittering agent, is uh, even less toxic orally. Uh, so that generally speaking, the normal phenols are not toxic, the abnormal may be. Well, unfortunately, I see I'm nearly out of time. I'll just show this one more. And this illustrates the point that if we take tannic acid orally in a mouse, and kill a hundred of them in this case. It takes six grams per kilogram of mice to kill them. 
subcutaneously only 200 and intravenously only 80. So the point being that normally taken phenols are not toxic, abnormally taken by injection or otherwise they may be extremely toxic. Uh, the carnivore story is also quite clear. The animals that uh, are not normal to eating lignified and a high percentage of plant material in the diet do uh, respond uh, reasonably well to phenols. The, the carnivores are, are more affected by phenols. The herbivores are generally not affected by the same level or much more tolerant. So I must quit at that point. of a large tank when you have a process which is the brewer the at Guinness takes about 25 of them and by the time they've thrown the last one in the thing is finished fermenting so there's a certain element of inconvenience um, in a tank which is too big. I think that the American brewers could very well use somewhat larger tanks, but their process is, is rather long, and by having a, a lot of smaller tanks, you have a much more flexible brewery than if you have just one zonking great thing, or a few great big ones. Are these jacketed with water for temperature regulation? Not usually. The entire building is usually air-conditioned. Well, because it's full. The tanks are full. Or, well, they're not full to the brim, but they're pretty well full. And then the headspace is very quickly taken with, uh, with uh, foam. So the air is displaced. That's right. So there's some, some proteinaceous material which precipitates best at high temperatures, and there is some additional material that precipitates when the wort is cool. So some hot break then travels all through the system? It's a little variable from brewery to brewery, but for the, for the case of what we're doing today, that's an adequate description. Yeah. Before air conditioning, where were these tanks? In, um, before air conditioning, you're talking about the 1860s, they were placed in caverns cut under the city of Milwaukee, which were filled with ice. And the ice was cut from the lakes. So the old breweries were very often called themselves the so-and-so brewery and ice company, because they had to be very much in the business of cutting ice. Oh, wait a minute, you're talking, we're talking about lagering. This is, this is fermentation, the same, same really applies. They were put in a cool place, which was mainly in underground caves, or in buildings with very, very heavy walls. Very heavy walls indeed. So there was a natural cooling effect. Yes? Is this the only fermentation? Is there a secondary one to develop carbon dioxide? Well, we can go on to that if you, if you like. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with that now. Are there any other questions? This will come out automatically. Yeah? You gave the lowest temperature. What would be the maximum temperature? About 15 degrees centigrade. And most breweries these days tend towards the upper temperature, 12 to 15. OK, we seem to have got quite a spurt of questions there for <laughs> perhaps I've done a lousy job with this lecture. <laughs> the um, process then is contained mainly in fermenters of this type, although when we get to fermentation, we shall see that there are many alternatives used in this country 
and elsewhere. This is the most common type of fermenter that you will see in American breweries. The fermentation then goes on. Of course, the yeast grows. During the course of its growth, it takes the sugar that we have made in mashing, and it converts it to alcohol and CO2. And these two considerations are perhaps of minor concern compared to the production of a host of other volatile fermentation products which contribute very much to beer flavor. And it is probably true to say that the main function of beer flavor is the flavor elements derived from the malt that is used and the flavor elements derived from the fermentation process. But since alcohol has comparatively little taste, it's of comparatively small importance in terms of flavor compared to the other spectrum of flavor compounds produced during fermentation. This then is primary fermentation. And what happens during the course of this is that the yeast, here is time, and here is yeast in suspension. The yeast grows, and then at a certain point, it does something that we call flocculate. And that is that it drops out of solution and settles on the bottom of the tank. So the beer more or less clarifies itself of yeast. So the yeast settles out. And at this time, we have a product which is commonly called Rue beer, R-U-H beer. <coughs> R-U-H beer, Rue beer, or green beer. And from this fermentation now, it is run to a process which is called, to a place which is called the lager cellar, and to a process which is called lagering. Lager cellar. And the process is called lagering. It is characterized by continued quiescent storage. And the temperature is about zero degrees centigrade, or perhaps a little less. And this storage period allows the beer to clarify and mature. to mature in flavor, and to clarify, and to become more physically stable. The gentleman asked whether there wasn't a secondary fermentation. And the answer is, yes, there certainly can be. And that process is called Krausening. Krausening. We shall see the Krausening process when we go to the if indeed we can go to the steam beer plant, uh, the Anchor Brewery in San Francisco. And the Krausening process is also used by the Olympia Brewery, Olympia Brewery in Tumwater. And what it consists of is to take this finished beer, which contains no fermentable sugar anymore, it's all gone, and one adds to that a calculated portion of wort which has had the yeast added, what we call pitched wort. Which is now actively fermenting. And that is simply tipped in to the lager tank. And the top is screwed down. And this charge, this Krausen, will now continue to ferment, locked inside this cold cellar. And it will produce carbon dioxide, of course, a little more alcohol, of course, a little more flavor component. And it will naturally carbonate the beer. That is the Krausening process. It is not terribly common because it obviously has its drawbacks. You have to make rather precise calculations of how much sugar, i.e. how much 
wort you're adding in this krausening process to get the right amount of carbon dioxide. I think um, lucky beer, lucky, the, the best lucky beer, lucky draft, is also krausened. But it's a, it's a pain for a brewer to have to do it that way. Um, it's a nuisance in many respects, and he only does it if he considers it's necessary for the kind of beer that he wants to make, for what he considers the epitome of his quality. Other than that, what he will do is to take the beer from lager storage, or while it's in lager storage, and he will inject carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide is very frequently the same carbon dioxide that was produced during fermentation. It's simply taken off the tank, liquefied, and re-injected into the finished beer. So from the lager tank, there is some injection of CO2, either in the line or in the tank itself. And we now come to the finishing processes, which consist essentially of active filtration, vigorous filtration. On large filter presses, usually using diatomaceous earth, and this then goes directly to final storage, and as quickly as possible now, the beer is, goes from final storage into some kind of package, and as quickly as possible then, it is moved now to the throats of the consumer. The point being that once you go beyond this stage, the quality of the beer is all downhill. So the minute you take it from its bulk storage tank and you start to mess with it, putting it in little tiny bottles, putting it in little tiny cans, you start pasteurizing it, you start um, shipping it on big trucks, you start warming it up and cooling it down, the quality of the beer is inevitably, at this point, downhill. There is no such thing as a fine bottle-aged beer. There is only a lousy bottle-aged beer. I believe there is such a thing as a fine bottle-aged wine, but this is not possible with beer. So from this bulk storage stage on through, the beer quality is irresistibly downwards. And so at this stage, then, the brewer does his best to ensure that the beer moves through the trade, through his own warehouse, through the communication system, and through the retail and wholesale trades as quickly as he can possibly make it move. And that is the only way that he can assure that the beer arrives on your table in the kind of quality that he would wish to see. In other words, the fresher the beer, the better the beer. OK, are there any questions? We have approximately five minutes. <coughs> yes, sir. The CO2 is generally collected. There is, there is a small positive pressure. Okay. And uh, what, what are some of the differences involved in using rice instead of corn? I, I would say that you wouldn't, you couldn't tell the difference. This is entirely one of those tradition things where one brewer as it occurs, would say, we always use rice, never mind what, because we believe in it. If he believes in it, great. Um, there would be economic considerations, but they vary enormously. If they use the crowdfunding process, how do they get the yeast out of the bottle? It settles. So then the bottom would have a Yeah, and settles, and then they filter it. They don't filter it. Oh, yes, yeah, so all beer has to be filtered. Yeah. And it's part of it. Not, not at the same time, but as part of the same process, yes. But now, of course, it's crowds, and so it has to be kept under pressure all the time. Yeah.